Recording in progress. All right. Okay. Let's... I think I'm recording now. Yes. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, I'll give uh, Inge the uh, floor then. All right. Let's just start by say welcome, everybody. We're now going to have a small debate, discussion, hopefully a conversation about veganism and the fact of killing animals for food and related issues. This all started out when uh, Christopher and Amos made a video discussing these topics uh, on YouTube. And then Samuel and Pula watched this and thought they had a lot of points there they wanted to discuss for them. So I'm just going to give the word uh, now to Christopher and uh, ask him to uh, explain what happened. Thank you. Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So just a little bit about myself uh, first. My name is Christopher Dörl. I'm a Norwegian student studying philosophy at the University of Oslo. Uh, some might mistakenly believe that I'm a radical classical liberal or libertarian, even an anarchist. So in case someone still believe that, I'll just clear things up and say that I used to be that a few years ago or some years ago but I have abandoned that philosophy altogether. So I'm not a libertarian or anarchist anymore. I would rather describe myself as a traditionalist conservative, and I support classical natural law theory in tradition of Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm also a traditional Catholic, uh, so people know that as well. And uh, to put it very briefly, I believe that it is morally acceptable in itself to kill animals for food and that therefore veganism as an ethical position is false. And that is what we'll be discussing uh, in this conversation. Okay, so I have a Norwegian YouTube channel, which is currently called Christopher Dörlen official channel, uh, which we'll find by just typing that in on YouTube. And for the past 18 months or so, at least uh, somewhat over a year, I've been making videos with almost Zweig here um, uh, through, uh, through digital means, uh, Zoom primarily, discussing many issues in philosophy, um, ethics, politics, etc. And he and I made a video not that long ago where we discussed veganism and why we did not support that uh, vegan philosophy that it's wrong to, to kill animals. We rather say, no, it's actually in itself acceptable to kill animals and we discuss that so yes that's a little bit about me and, and my channel all right thank you i guess Amos can do the next presentation yes uh, thank you very much so my name is Amos Zweig i uh, studied mechanical engineering and i am currently working as an author and writing a book on the rise and fall of civilizations. And yes, as Christopher said, we made YouTube videos together for over a year now. And yeah, I don't want to go into the details of our video now. I think uh, we can do that in the discussion. Yeah, there's not really much more to say about me. I also have a YouTube channel. I will put the link in the description. And yeah, so the next person can present themselves. Perfect. Then we move on to Perula. Yeah, right. Uh, so um, Perula is my name. Uh, most people just know me as Vegan Dragon due to this um, horrible Norwegian pronounced name in different languages. Anyways, um, I basically make uh, content around uh, surrounding veganism, but also videos out and about uh, nature, strolling, uh, adventurous type of stuff, but also some other type of videos, uh, of course. Um, I saw uh, this video, but uh, Christopher and I go even further back, um, I think like two or three years ago, uh, when we actually had discussions about veganism in the past, and I wanted to debate in them, and we decided that we were going to uh, subscribe to each other's channel so we know a little bit more about each other's uh, opinion, but it, it took some time till there was anything vegan related, but when once I saw that video, um, I was thinking in my head that I didn't really understand most of the arguments used because if I feel as if I use words differently than um, Christopher and Amos does, in which uh, they use one certain word and I don't really know what they mean about a certain word. And 
I feel like their position is just totally arbitrary. So I just wanted to see if if they have a um, uh, really a consistent position uh, with regards to like what really uh, vegans actually believe in, and uh, also within like the um, rules of philosophy, basically. Yeah, perfect, good. Then I guess uh, Samuel will go next. Yeah, hey everybody, my name is Samuel Rostal, uh, which was, is also an awkward name to say in English, um, the last one is at, at least. I am a full-time animal rights activist, and I've been doing debates on veganism for quite a while. Um, not too many things on YouTube or anything else, but I do have a Facebook page where I share my my, my thoughts. Um, it was Per Ola who shared the video of the debate with me, and after seeing it, I thought that it would be a good thing to, to talk about, because for me, at least from my stand, stand, viewpoint, there are a lot of things there that needs to be further debated than just two people basically agreeing with each other from the first point on. And um, obviously my stance is that animals should not be used for food or clothes or anything, and that we should leave them alone, and that's, that that is the only moral thing to do. And I'm looking forward to, for this debate and to see if we can get any, anywhere close to each other, rather than just being in two different pages. Super, thanks. Uh, my name is Inge. Uh, my last name, Madshaven. <laughs> Welcome to this debate. That's, I think that's a nice introduction. And uh, I don't know who wanna go first. Uh, so, what do re vegans really believe? Is is that a good place to start? Uh, yeah, maybe Samuel could start with that one because he's like a representative. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah, I can I can take a touch on that. Um, like for vegans, the, our stance is quite simple. Um, we have, as a humanity, we've now evolved past the point where we needed to use animals for, for any reasons at all. Of course, that's not true for all places in the world, but it's definitely true for us who live in, in, in the more developed parts of the world. And it follows then logically that we should simply not uh, to have animals in captivity to kill them uh, needlessly and unnecessarily is simply just um, barbaric traits. And it's needs. It, it, there's no good reason to do it except for the fact that it's it's simple. It can be. It's convenient if you disregard the animal's position altogether, which we we as vegans don't. Um, for me, it's just a, a logical step in our evolution that we now stop enslaving and preying on other animal species. And I think that's maybe the wording is different from vegan to vegan but in general i think that would be the the way vegans think that we should sim simply not, not cause unnecessary pain and suffering and harm to animals who are simply simply put um innocent in everything that we do to them i feel as yeah. If, yeah well sorry um yeah i feel as there's one thing that you're lacking in um in that type of uh re um of sense in which uh, how we really explain things uh, with regard, regards to uh, philosophy, because there's a big why in that kind of uh, explanation. Like for example, me, I would say that I have a preference of not harming animals because I know that I myself would not like to get harmed. And I can't think of a meaningful difference between uh, humans and animals that would make it okay to harm, um, uh, harm uh, an animal or, uh, no, sorry, would it make it okay to harm a human? even if all the relevant traits are equalized from the animal to the human. So I, I just don't, yeah, I just don't find it to be logical to treat animals different when it comes to right to life, suffering uh, and exploitation, basically. Yeah. That was, I guess, the opening statement. Amos, yeah. you want to take it away? Yes, I uh, would like to present my initial thoughts to this. So. I think it, it would be important uh, to define a couple of terms because, for example, Samuel said that um, human beings have evolved past the stage where we have to use animals to survive. Therefore, we now should no longer do this. And so with the should comes the question of morality. And there comes the question uh, what is actually morality? What is the definition of good, bad, or right, wrong, should, shouldn't? Um, 
what is the origin of moral rules, what is their purpose, and on what categories are they applicable or not applicable. And the same holds for, for other words that um, Samuel and Per Ola have used, like uh, barbarity or enslave or prey on something or to harm something. And yeah, and of course, also the difference between human beings and animals, which Per Ola has brought up just in his last statement, would be an important point to touch upon. Other comments, Christopher? Right, yes. So uh, interesting um, points being brought up that can, of course, be discussed a lot. And I would sort of have the same approach as Amos, that this goes to the, the issues of moral philosophy. And as I perceive it, veganism involves a moral claim, claim that it is wrong morally wrong to kill animals in order to eat them. And I would say that, okay, let's discuss this. Let's look at whether that's really true or not. And as Amos and I uh, sort of argued in our video, we would say that no morality and moral rights, when we have a proper and, and sound and reasonable account of what is morality, what it is about, what is its purpose, and also what is the purpose and essence of moral rights, it would not be correct or valid to make the claim that animals have a moral right not to be killed. Um, so that is sort of the approach I'm taking, that I am sort of defending the idea that human beings and animals are different in that animals have certain qualities, or sorry, the other way around, that human beings have certain qualities that animals do not have. And that difference is relevant when it comes to moral rights, that when we consider who has moral rights and why, that is something that is uh, making a difference between human beings and animals. So to put it very briefly, I would say that uh, it is, it can be morally acceptable to kill animals for food because animals lack a moral right to life human beings on their hand uh, human beings on the other hand we do have a moral right to life and therefore it's wrong to kill us but not animals and of course many vegans would dispute that and say well why is there a difference there but that is uh, what almost and i've uh, attempted to argue that there is a relevant difference when it comes to morality yeah so then we have quite a lot of topics and uh, someone is interested to make a comment yeah, just just quickly, um, do you disagree that humans are animals? Well, that is actually a good question because I I'm not quite sure. I think animals in many contexts are used as living organisms that are able to move and have some basic features, but other than human beings, that human beings are not animals because of our unique features. However, I personally do not think that it's that important whether you categorize humans as animals or not, because then we'll just redefine the issues and say animals other than human beings. So I think the argument will work either way. Uh, okay, I may yeah. briefly, I, in my mind, human beings are clearly animals, um, but they have certain unique features, which um, some philosophers have defined humans as the rational animal, whereby rationality is the feature and perhaps complex language that sets human beings apart from all other animals. But other than that, they have characteristics that they share in common with animals. Yeah, um, can I comment on that one? Because uh, there is something that I just find to be very weird because it seems that most people are just making like some arbitrary differences in in order to um, to um, uh, make a, a moral justification, and mostly they just point to that we are very different from many other animals. But the main different, uh, the main reason we are very different from most other animals is because we've basically killed off everyone that looks like us. <laughs> but but it's also it also seems like you're simply saying we are us and nobody else is like us. So we are the only ones 
who have rights because we are the ones who grants rights. We are the one who have the definition of, or the power of definition because we are the ones who created the words rights or created the words morals. Um, and it, it just, for me, it doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't, it doesn't sound logical that just because we are of a different species and have um, different traits, then we have more value. Because if you look at, for example, like certain animals have far greater vision than we have. Some animals have far greater hearing than we have. Some animals have far greater perception of reality than we have and hear and see different things that we do. Um, we are the only species on this planet who, who has been for over 100 years now uh, consistently been destroying everything around us. So why are we the, why are we the kind of benchmark that that kind of why are we put on the top if you, if you look away from a religious perspective and then i know that that's we are different on this but if you look away from the idea that god created us as super compared to everything else well, how are we better how, why should our kind of perspective on ourselves our selfish perspective on ourselves define how we can treat other living beings so here i think it would be very natural uh, for me to bring up why uh, I would say that there is a difference between human beings and other animals here. And it goes back to, okay, what is moral rights and morality all about, as Amos brought up? And I would say, I would argue that morality is about making free choices to do what is good for oneself. So in other words, morality is about having an agent with the capacity to make free choices, having free will, choose between right and wrong, and is able to freely and rationally choose to do something that is good for that agent. And when you make such a free choice to do that which is good, then your actions become morally significant. Because of course you have all sorts of things in reality which might do things that is good for it, but they don't freely choose to do so. For instance, a tree can mature and grow and create uh, leaves and all that, but it's not something it does out of free will. It is simply something that it does out of its own nature automatically, out of necessity. And therefore there is no reason to have morality there. So in order, so I would therefore say that morality, what makes something moral or morally significant is about choices, free choices to do that which is good and therefore, in order to be uh, a being which has moral significance, you must have the inherent capacity or potential for free will. In other words, you need to have the capacity to make moral goods. Moral goods are goods which have a moral character and they have that moral character because the agent is making a free choice to do good and choose between good and bad. And since we human beings have free will, we can choose between right and wrong, we have the capacity to actualize moral goods or moral virtues, if you will, like prudence, uh, fortitude, temperance, patience, and justice. So I would therefore say when it comes to moral rights, moral rights is about protecting an agent in his pursuit of realizing moral goods. So contrary to what some vegan philosophers might say, the purpose of moral rights is not to protect a being simply from death or even from simply not experiencing pain. It's rather about protecting an agent in realizing moral goods, which presupposes free will and the ability to choose between right and wrong. And this is the feature we see with human beings and not animals or other animals. So, of course, this argument I could elaborate and explain more, but that's at least why I maintain what I maintain to some extent. I think it's a good and interesting start. And I do think that Samuel and Paula would agree with a lot of that, except from the difference between humans to other animals. So uh, what's the significance you would place there, Samuel? Well. I think, first of all, I think it's interesting that morality is about make, about enabling other humans to do what they want. That is basically what you're saying, in, in my, if, if I understand you correctly, um, and that, that those things that we should do should be good things. Um, it's about making free choices, and then you kind of just claim that animals do not have any kind of free will. 
basically reducing them to robots who act simply upon upon um, instincts. And I know for a fact that this is not true. So there's a lot of presuppositions here that I don't agree with. And also, if morality is only around humans, then we have created a loophole that will never include other species at all. So it will be moral then to uh, to harm other animals if we are not harmed by it ourselves. It would be moral to to stab pigs in the back on, if we feel some kind of pleasure or if we gain something from it. Uh, and I would say that that's not true. And I mean, humans can choose to do good things with our moral agency, but we are not. We are like in general, we are destroying the planet and we are killing other beings, which are not good actions. Um, except if you think that ki killing and harming non-humans is by default uh, um, uh, uh, action that has no moral value at all. And I, it just doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, if, if I may respond to that, um... There are a couple of points um, that come up here. First, I would just have to mention that I disagree with this notion that we are killing and destroying the whole planet around us. I don't agree with that. And also, uh, we could perhaps discuss the harming of animals for other purposes than eating them at a later point. I think Christopher and I agree that this is immoral though we agree probably for different reasons so i think we should stay on the on the point of killing animals in order to eat them and the the question of morality and i i agree with to some sense with things that you have said that it doesn't make sense to say human beings have rationality therefore it's okay for us to kill other animals or not care about them that's not the point that Christopher and I are making. Um, the point is that morality is a human concept. And it's not that we simply define that morality only uh, pertains to humans and thereby create a loophole, as you put it, Samuel. But it's that um, from the nature or from the inherent characteristics of humans as compared to other animals, um, we believe that it follows that morality only applies to human beings. And there are, I will just briefly try to, to explain why I believe this to be the case. So, um, yeah, as Christopher mentioned, um, human beings have the capacity of free will. Now, yeah, I would be interested in your knowledge about free will of other animals. I, to my knowledge, uh, it is that animals act more on instinct, but I'm open to learn something new. And, but the point is, be that as it may, um, human beings discuss through conversation with each other how they should or should not behave. Um, you don't see other animals discussing rules of behavior um, and also like the idea of, of a contract or an agreement. Um, I, I like to make this example. I cannot make a contract with my mouse in, with the mouse that lives in the basement of my house that I will not kill it if it will not eat my, uh, food that I have put there in the, in the basement, the mouse will just eat whatever it wants and breed however it can. And there isn't this possibility of, of agreeing on certain behaviors as human beings do when they live together in groups. So yeah, that's maybe a start why I feel that morality applies only to human beings, not by definition, but from the characteristics that distinguish human beings from animals. Yeah, but Amos, you, you do realize that uh, that other animals also have two sides of their brain, right? There, there is not only the one part that is all about emotions and instincts. They also have a rational part of their brain. Yes. Yeah. So wouldn't it be uh, so wouldn't it be logical to say that they also have some kind of ration? 
okay, you don't. I don't know. I mean, they do have two parts of their brain. I would certainly agree with that, but I don't know what goes on in the mind of an animal, and I don't think that this so far is a convincing argument. No, no, no. I'm just trying to say that uh, John, to explain why that that you just said doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Like, um, it doesn't sound like you've had much to do with animals whatsoever. Like, for example, our pig here, he is very, very picky eater. Do you think that it's instinct that he's picky? Well, if I could uh, comment here, I would say that it is true that we can see some uh, very fascinating things that animals do. Uh, apart from also instinct, for instance, um, yeah, just to, to speak about emotion as well, you can see uh, animals who have children or offspring, and they have a strong affection for that offspring. Well, for instance, stories about elephants who sacrifice a lot in order to help uh, a small elephant from dying or drowning and things like that. And that's very fantastic and beautiful and fascinating to look at. And also you can, I have heard about some instances of, I think, birds or something that are able to solve some tasks and, and there have been done experiments with that. And that seemed very interesting and fascinating, but I failed to see here a, uh, some evidence that they have therefore the ability to make moral choices and to choose between right and wrong. It seems that animals, they act either based on instinct or some, uh, or some emotion or affection, but it takes a, a completely other power, an intellectual power, in order to abstractly understand right from wrong and be able to even restrain your feelings and, and sensations, etc., in order to make choices, rational choices, and comprehend morality. And this is something we see with human beings and not animals. That's also why we don't hold animals morally accountable for doing things. We don't hold a lion morally accountable for attacking a human being or other animals, even though that's very tragic if that happens. It's simply the, something blind us out of its own nature. But human beings are held morally accountable because we have free will, we can abstractly understand right from wrong. So even if we see animals doing interesting things, that's not the same as being a moral agent. Well. If I could respond to that, I think that one of the things that things that does distinguish humans from other animal species is def definitely that we have abilities that many animals do not. Um, and I don't really care that much about whether animals are moral agents or not. Um, as far as I know, they are not. I don't see anything immoral with a wolf securing his or her own survival by killing pain in painfully. Uh, uh, a member of the prey species. Um, there is nothing immoral in killing for survival. And even if you kill by ripping up their guts and eating on the legs while the animal's still alive, it is tragic, but it's not immoral. So I would agree with you to a certain extent that animals do not have moral agency. But I don't define whether or not somebody who should be... Um, I don't define whether or not we should take care of somebody or respect somebody based on their moral agency. I like I think that this this whole debate is kind of flawed in that you you presuppose you presuppose that since animals do not have moral agency, then we should not grant them any kind of rights at all. And I think it's the opposite. I think that since we are at the position we are uh, in regards to all, all other species on this planet, we should grant them. Um, rights. We should we should de decide for our, for both for our own sake and for their sake that we should not harm them simply because it is not necessary. And the whole idea of defining animals' ability to communicate based on whether or not they can communicate so that we understand them is also a flaw. If you if you judge an elephant by its ability to climb a tree, well then the elephant is always stupid. But if you look at how animal species communicate within their own groups, if you see how they build societies, if you see how they how they actually live their lives and study this closer, then you will see that animals do not. They don't simply just act on instincts. Uh, we've seen animals grieve the death of their siblings. There's nothing um, useful in that. Um, it's just it just takes a lot of energy and, and could kill them. But they grieve, and we've seen we see when you study when you study like samples of their feces, you can see you can see a spike of of sorrow 
uh, hormones in their feces that gradually goes down as time goes down. There is the whole idea that the only animal on this planet who have a free will is the one animal that represent us is is something most people who are versed within like animal rights movement are, are thinking call anthropocentrism like we are the center of the universe and nothing is like us ergo we can do whatever we want to the other ones but i also like to throw in one other thing is that since we choose to harm animals and define them as as non-worthy of our own um, compassion and, and, and respect and love because that's what we do when we kill them we are also harming ourselves because that kind of ideology kind of uh, follows through when we look at other humans and think well they're not as good as us so we can harm them as well so learning to abuse and 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 subjugate and and bind as slaves the animals that that's the first kind of oppression humans learn as children and that also transfers into humanity i was when i was a kid and myself, I was bullied a lot, and I would daily be called animal in some form, like a dog or a pig or whatever. And that is, we use that as a gateway to oppress other humans as well. Okay, I guess that was a lot to unpack, so uh, you should deserve a good response, I guess. Yes, I think these are good points that you brought up. Um, I would, and I agree with couple of them. I would be interested if Perola would also um, agree that animals are not moral agents. Perhaps just briefly. Uh, well, it depends on the species, definitely. I know that I can't call most carnivorous animals uh, moral agents, uh, but I, I know like, it, like they might have some moral agency to some extent. Um, it's very common for, uh, for someone within the same species, but that also differs. Um, but to a high degree, I guess that humans um, are more of a moral agent. Uh, so I just tend to agree more with Samuel there because um, because uh, they are um, because we are moral agents. Therefore, we should make the moral choices. But I, I also have a little bit of disagreement. It's not that important, but I don't think it's moral for animals to uh, rip each other, each other apart. But I have like some. Uh, pragmatic issues with uh, intervening in nature, basically. Okay. Yes, because if, if I just may very briefly, um, I, I think this is one of the one of the important points that Christopher and I developed in our last conversation, and it would be great if all four of us could more or less agree on this at this early stage in our conversation, that because the, the way we phrased it is that human beings are uh, moral agents or are the subjects of morality because we can make moral choices, whereas animals are not the subject, but one of the many objects of morality in the sense that moral rules or norms have to do with how human beings as agents treat other animals or interact with them just like they have to do how we interact with each other or with nature or with uh, uh, what's this uh, not living things like stones or water or plants which are living but not animals so would you two agree that uh, human beings are the subjects of moral choices and animals are one of the many possible objects of moral choices I'm not actually sure uh, exactly what you're trying to ask here, uh, to, to be honest. So if, if, you, if you think that I, that I don't think that animals can make moral choices, well, of course, we have bears saving, uh, saving crows, for example. We know that we have um, uh, rats that has uh, already almost drowned, are more likely to save another rat that is almost drowning. So they, I guess that they have some kind of moral, but that um, many of them are not as evolved as us in morals, probably. Yeah, I could chime in on that. I, I think that it's hard to understand exactly what you're asking. But if you're asking if humans are basically the 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 definite who defines what moral is, 
and that we we kind of like branch out our understanding of what moral is on all other beings. And of course, that's true. We are the inventors of our human language. So there is no other animal on this species that speaks our language. And thus, this discussion is mainly for humans. But I think I might have misunderstood the question. Yeah, no, the, the question is because you said um, that, for example, uh, human be uh, animals are not moral agents. But we human beings are moral agents, and therefore we should still grant animals the same rights or a certain set of rights that we grant other human beings because um, we as human beings are moral agents. So uh, the point would be that it is the human being who um, thinks in terms of rights and thinks in terms of morality and then the, the the question whether or how we should treat animals or not treat animals is a moral question pertaining to human beings like you said it doesn't pertain to a wolf uh, the question of that he shouldn't kill his prey uh, by inflicting a lot of pain on it. Okay, I think I understand you better now. Um, what I think is that if you look at nature, there is almost no species that will kill another species unless it's necessary. Um, the wolf in nature, well, it, it does change when it meets tame animals, but in nature, it's really true that a wolf will chase after an animal if it's not necessary for him, him or her to eat. And I think that this could be interpreted as moral or simply just energy effectiveness. And we humans have kind of transcended that as well. We can now keep animals as our slaves and kill them as we want. And it's energy effective for me as an individual to buy a pack of meats compared to buy uh, one kilogram of whatever, like salad or whatever. Um, but I think that in terms of rights, I think just, or, or, or morals, I just think that we, we, I don't really care about the wording that we use. I just think that we should not be assholes to other beings and they basically behave um, with a sense of, of kindness and by enslaving and keeping them captive and killing them, we are doing the opposite of that. And, and we can, we can look just upon like our own development as humans, if we want to be as uh, prosper as possible, then empathy and, and community has been one of the main ways to do that. And, and killing animals just defeats that purpose. Yeah, sorry, if I can, oh, sorry. Oh, no, uh, just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I'm thinking throughout this is that um, moral agency is important because, um, well, f to that one who is uh, or has moral agency. Uh, so it doesn't make sense for me to harm uh, any, anyone because I myself has moral agency. So even though uh, you might have some kind of animals or some uh, kind of like infant child that doesn't have, uh, have um, uh, moral agency, it doesn't make sense for me to kill them. Uh, but what is really important here, if they lack it, it's very hard to judge them if they kill somebody. So either if it's a wolf who kill out of necessity, or if there is a child who doesn't understand uh, the acts of just grabbing a knife and, and, and killing their friend, uh, I won't keep them accountable because they already they, they, they haven't uh, already uh, achieved like enough moral agency to understand that that is, that is wrong, basically. So many points were brought up here. And I will start by saying that the, the, one of the very core things that I am defending is that moral rights are entrusted to those who have the potential to promote moral goods, in other words, moral agents. And I would say that apart from this principle, it doesn't make sense to grant someone a moral right. And this is, I would say, a problem for vegans. One can ask them, on what basis would you grant animals the right to life? It is not about the ability to promote moral goods, then what is it? And some would try to argue, well, it's about the capacity or uh, the, the, um, 
condition of not feeling harm or not feeling pain or even not feeling death, that sentience or, or the ability to feel pain, that should be the, the, the basis of moral rights. But there is nothing morally significant with just the ability to feel pain itself. It's simply, yeah, it's something you can experience, but it's, it, it, morality doesn't arise from that. Rather, we see that morality arises from choices, rational choices made. That is what makes a choice or an action morally significant. And if you don't have that, if you don't base moral rights on protecting an agent in his quest for promoting moral virtues or moral goods, there is no basis for moral rights. So it, 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 it doesn't make sense to say that uh, an animal, other than human being at least, can have moral rights because there is no moral agency. There is nothing for that animal to have the potential to promote when it comes to morality. So even if we have cases of animals doing things based on affection or feeling, I think you mentioned Per Ola, uh, some ice bears to save the life of another type of species. I don't exactly recall, but something along the uh, lines. Brown bear, yeah, yeah. Brown bear, yes. I would say that, well, that's very interesting and fascinating, but this is accounted for by them having some sort of emotion or affection. And there is no evidence there of having an, an intellectual grasp of distinguishing between right and wrong, and therefore no basis for morality or moral rights at all. So that's why it's rational to grant moral rights in moral agency. And this, this is important. This is not simply a bias toward human beings, a, an example of speciesism. The idea that we simply and trust, uh, we simply grant ourselves human uh, moral rights and not other animals because we are humans and we have a bias toward ourselves. That's not the issue. We are granting, we are, we are presenting a rational, logical account for moral rights, objective moral rights and morality. And apart from this position, there is no rational basis to grant morality. Well, I, I would first of all start by saying that I completely disagree with the last sentence that you said. You said that this has nothing to do with speciesism and nothing to do with base, like with biases towards their own species, but you are defining, uh, uh, um, you are making definitions for morality that only suits the species that you belong to. So I think that that you are doing the complete opposite of what you're saying that you are, you are defining, you are basing it on, I am a human and this is how I perceive the world. Ergo, I will create a definition that suits me perfectly. But we could, we could also, and this is a question to both of you, Amos and Christopher, we could look away uh, from the idea of the moral right to live as you speak about. And let's, let's ignore that for a second and say that we don't, we don't have that power of definition of other animals or living animals uh, rights to live. Maybe we should ask the, the opposite question. What gives us the right to take away life from other living animals? Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Interesting, interesting point. Perhaps uh, let's, go in this direction, I would like to eventually come back to this question of the right to live, but let's, you yeah, know, first I have to make a small point. Um, um, I don't think it's a fair criticism of Christopher's position to say that he or we just uh, define morality in a way that only suits humans. If I say birds can fly and human beings cannot fly, this is not a arbitrary definition in the sense of um, wanting to favor some kind of uh, species over another, but it's simply a fact that follows from the characteristics of the object in question. And so this would go uh, to this point that you said you want to leave for the moment, but I still think it's important. Um, on the question of what gives us the right to kill another animal, um, I think the point is um, basically nourishment. So we see all throughout nature that different kind of animal species eat other kind of animal or plant species. A plant also doesn't want to be eaten. It probably would, if you can think in that way, it, it is striving to grow. And if you start to eat it, then you actually work against 
its inbuilt uh, goal, but that's the way nature is, that one living being has to eat another living being in order to live. And therefore, that would be my answer to this question. And also, if I also can very briefly answer that question, I would say that, uh, as Amo said, we it's, it's acceptable for us to kill human beings for food and food is nourishment for us. So that's a good thing. And the very relevant point is when we kill animals for food, there wait, is wait, no... wait, wait, you just said it's acceptable to kill human beings for food. Oh, sorry. If I said so, I, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. I, I meant animals. I meant animals, not human beings. Sorry. Um, it's okay to kill animals for food because it's, it gives something good for us, namely nourishment and there is no moral right being violated. So if we fail to give animals uh, a basis for moral rights, well, if we kill them, there is no right being violated. So that's why it's okay for us to kill them for food, but not it's not okay to kill human beings for food because, that, because we have the moral right to life. I have a question there uh, because I, I can sort of agree to the fact that you don't violate somebody else's moral rights if you kill something that doesn't is not a moral agent but does that mean that it's a moral good you mean that the, the end in question food or nourishment if that is a moral good or not no i mean that if you as a moral agent uh, a subject i think you called it uh while you have the animals and you would call them objects can you act on an object as you like and still be moral that is a, a good question and i would i think i would say no and this would perhaps get us into the question of animal abuse and how we can as almost and i argue we can still be against animal abuse even if it's okay to kill animals for food and that is of course the way something we can discuss further later but I would say, no, there are limits, but when it comes to merely killing an animal for food, that's legitimate because we do something for the good of our body. Yeah. So you wouldn't say that it's abusive to kill someone? Not intrinsically. How so? Can you explain that, please? Well, because when we, when we kill them, we are doing it for something that is good for us. But, but not for them. Say, Yes, it, it, it leads to death for them. So that's true. But when I'm thinking of animal abuse, I'm thinking of cases where we harm animals for no, uh, re no reason that is actually objectively good for human beings. Nourishment is a good for human being. But if you hurt an animal because you are wanting to have fun, then you're simply mentally distorted. You're not having, you're not doing something for the sake of something good for your body. Well, you could argue that entertainment is good for your body. And if you get a lot of entertainment from watching two dogs fight to the death, then that could be good for your body. You feel uh, endorphins, you feel uh, dopamine, you feel a lot of good things. And, and, and then we turn back to the, the, to the point of nourishment because you have two ways of getting the exact same nourishment. One is by killing, one is by not killing uh, another animal. And um, so I, for me, that, that, that creates kind of like this idea that if you if you're against abuse, then killing another living being, especially one that can feel, would be definitely a sort of abuse if it's not necessary for your own survival. I mean, here we get into the question of what constitutes a moral good and what doesn't. And I think this is a, a complex uh, question in itself. Um, of course, as you just did, Samuel, some people do argue that feeling any kind of pleasure is a good, but I think both Christopher and I would argue that the just the fact of experiencing a pleasurable sensation is not um, a moral good, but what is or isn't a moral good comes from the question of what is actually the nature of a human being in this question and what is um, kind of conducing to fulfilling the definition of one's nature as best as possible. So 
Yeah, it's difficult to ask, answer this briefly, but we get into a big question there. Okay, so you say that because it is part of human nature, therefore it is good. Am I, am I understanding you right? Not exactly. I'm saying that whether or not something is good or not comes from human nature in the end. Human yeah. nature is the, the kind of uh, the fact in reality from which we can derive answers to the question whether something is morally good or not. And how, would you, how do we do that? That's a big question. That's a big debate. But, but, um, I can't answer this in one sentence, but uh, we can get into this topic if we finish the other one. But aren't you now again presupposing that just that human value is the only value in which we we see the world? So if something is okay for humans, then it's good. That's that's how I understand what you're saying. If it, if something uh, benefits human um, nature, then it's by definition good. So if if we kill innocent beings, but it benefits us in some way, then it's morally good. No, it's it's not about benefiting and it's not about just human beings. So for example, every animal species also has a nature. For example, the wolf also has a nature and part of its nature is that it is a carnivore and has to eat meat and that it has certain physical properties and these define the way in which it hunts in order to live and so a good wolf is a wolf that hunts successfully whereas a bad wolf is one who cannot hunt successfully and therefore dies so the question of whether something is a good uh, instance of this category to which it belongs uh, is not limited to humans at all. Okay, good. Then I understand you better. So, so then the question comes back to you, since we have two sources of, of, of nutrients, one that does cause suffering and pain uh, to millions and billions of individuals, and one does, that does not. How is it more moral for humans to eat animals? Or how is it moral for humans to eat animals when we don't have to? because it's not in our nature to necessarily eat animals when we don't have to. If I could answer that uh, before you almost, if that's okay. Yeah, I would say that, okay, even if for the sake of the argument, we grant that it's possible to live healthy and be sufficiently nourished without ever eating an animal, even if we grant that for the sake of the argument, it would still be true that it is a good to eat animal food because that animal food it's still good for the body to take an, uh, another example of this take for instance an apple to eat apples is also good for your body however it's I, I suppose it could be possible to live your entire life and still be healthy without ever eating apples but still it, it just because there are alternatives doesn't mean that what you're doing necessarily is bad and uh, you, you mentioned Samuel well there is uh, relevant in that one in the one uh, case, we are hurting billions of lives, but in the other case, we don't hurt billions of, of lives. However, my argument, as I have argued uh, to now, would be that, well, again, animals do not have a moral right to life due to this argument I was defending. Therefore, that's not an issue. If animals did have a moral right to life, then absolutely, we shouldn't eat animal food and we should choose the alternative. But because it's morally legitimate, to eat animal food and still and, and since animal food is still good for the body even if alternatives exist i don't see any moral problem intrinsically intrinsically to eat animals for food but, but now you just again repeat that animals do not have a moral right to live because you have presupposed that i don't see that there is a value argument but that is true so i mean i mean we can keep repeating the same sentences over and over again but i don't think it is, that it's that is true that animals do not have a moral right to live. We have just defined or decided that we don't think animals have the moral right to live based on our preferences. No, no, yeah. but this is this is exactly well, what they've been arguing for the last hour, that because of we are agents, we have free will, we can choose between right and wrong, that for, that's why we have moral goods. So that's what they've been arguing so far. Sorry. Well, I, I don't really know what that matters, really. And um, there is, a, and, and I just want to see if, you, if you're uh, consistent with this. So, um, 
I'm just like you. You're saying that this and that makes it okay to uh, to kill one and not the other. So basically, what I want you two to do um, is to basically name a morally substantive difference between humans and animals. Um, like what is lacking in an animal that if the same thing were to lack in a human would also make it okay to kill the human as well. And um, and if you say that there is nothing, then that obviously leads to like a logical contradiction. Um, no, that's, I think that's kind of, uh, you are trying to force us here in an impossible position and uh, the argument is not valid. Um, it's like if I would ask you, okay, name something that is lacking in a rock, which a human being has, which would make it okay to, to break the rock, uh, but not the human being. It's a different... Uh, I can answer that. Yeah, you can, but it's a different entity. And the point is that rights are... A right, a right is a human concept that humans have the, uh, come up with or use to organize their interaction in society and also their actions uh, with the material world. So why, for example, I do not have the right to eat the chicken of my neighbor, but I do have the right to eat my own chicken. So now, this, so, so. Is, this is a form of organizing the living together of human beings. And therefore, a right is a concept which only pertains to human beings or to moral subjects okay. and not to moral objects. And so that would be my uh, criterion why there is a, a fundamental difference here and a difference that is important. Yeah, well, the relevance of my question, then you must be accept that if we didn't grant humans rights, then it would be morally okay to kill humans as well. Yes, but that's okay. why we have this concept of rights. Okay, okay. So, so really, so if we go into a separate world where everything is 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 uh, um, equal to how it is in our world, except we haven't granted rights, you wouldn't see a problem with people people killing other people in that world. Again, this is kind of a a trick question because no, it's not. You, yes, because. It's not like we have just, we live in a kind of world and then we arbitrarily define and grant rights, just like I can, I don't know, draw something on this piece of wood here and, or I could not do it. But the fact that human beings live together and the rules by which they can or cannot live together is not just arbitrary. And so it's not just an arbitrary grant that I or anyone else can make to say, ah, this person now has a right to life. Uh, this is a concept that we use to organize our interaction. It's not just a definition that can or cannot be made uh, as I please. Well, well then I, th I think it's more useful to just try and figure out why it makes sense to give humans rights and not animals then instead of just saying oh we have rights yeah may i jump in quickly here just to say that <clears throat> you defined um per ola's first question as a trick question and it, it's to, to a certain degree that's true i think that it's it, it is a way to see um a way to to kind of like draw out the differences that we grant or that we see between humans and other animals that distinguish us as the only one who should have moral rights or, or rights and all. And since you cannot answer that question, you basically just just prove that it is the the, the fact that we the, this, that we are the ones to make the decisions, that we are had the ones with the definition power, and 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 that have that, those rights. So the 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 defining fact that makes us the recipient of the right to live is the fact that we're humans. That is basically, since you cannot answer that question or since you won't answer that question, what is the difference that makes us the recipient of rights? So then it's just like, it just proves the point that, well, it's just simply the fact that we're humans. So um, I would perhaps 
answer somewhat differently than Amos uh, here. Sorry, Amos. <laughs> um, because I would say, yes, it's a, it's a valid question. And my answer would be that the relevant difference between human beings and animals is the capacity to make moral choices. The capacity to make moral choices. That is the relevant difference, because if you have the capacity to make moral choices, and in other words, realize moral goods or moral virtues, then we have a basis for moral rights in that being. But if we have an, uh, a being that does not have that capacity, there is no grounding of moral rights. That's why uh, human beings have moral rights, but not animals. So if we have humans who cannot precipitate those uh, values, then it's okay to kill those humans? If, if human beings in this hypothetical world did not have the capacity, inherent potential for moral goods, then, then that my argument would fail. But, but as there are certain people, humans, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, but there yeah. are certain humans that do not have that capacity in this world that we live in right now. Yeah, you're thinking of infants and uh, like no, that. No, people with, with severe um, brain damage, people with, with different impairments that they simply do not uh, recipro or reciprocate any kind of moral rights. They just act uh, according to their own uh, ways. There are definitely a lot of humans who do not follow into your definition of moral rights then. We, we don't okay, even right. have to take like uh, people who have brain damage or uh, mentally disabled. We have people who are psychopaths who don't have those uh, abilities, for example. Right, okay, so this is, uh, um, you could, I suppose you would also, some would say the same about infants as well, that they also lack the moral uh, ability as well. Okay, so my answer to this would be that it is true for some human beings they are not able to actualize moral goods because something external is blocking them, such as a severe mental disability or, or something like that. However, they have still the inherent potential within themselves. Not everyone. Yes, I would say that if they have the potential, but it's something blocking that potential from being actualized. So by, by virtue of the fact that they are human beings, they have a morally significant nature because that nature in its nature literally have the capacity for moral choices. It's true that some human beings are not able to actualize those, those choices. Something is blocking them or preventing them from actually doing it. But the potential is still grounded in their very being. Um, How do you define that? Sorry? How do you define that the potential is there? Is it simply again because they are human beings, which is again circular logic? You're just saying because humans thus rights and rights because humans. It's, it, I mean, I, I don't see anything else than her circular logic here. Oh, it's, it's based on just facts about human nature. To take another, uh, to make an example, we know that infants lack certain qualities that adult human beings have. However, it's still true that that infant has potential qualities that later will be actualized as the infant matures and becomes an adult. So we can make a distinction between potentiality and actuality. This is a distinction going all the way back to Aristotle, which explains change, that change is the actualization of potential. So this is grounded in, in facts about human nature. But then again, you skip those humans who do not have that potential or, or will never uh, actualize that potential. So you're just saying that that all humans, because all humans uh, are humans, ergo, um, we could say that they have that potential, even if, even if individuals don't. So you're basically saying that we can kill certain individuals if they never are able to accept, uh, actualize those, those uh, uh, qualities. I would, I would at this point um, say that we do treat people differently who do not have the moral, the capacity for moral choice or the, the this uh, faculty of, of moral choice. So, for example, um, we we um, we hinder their free movement or we hinder their access to certain tools that other grown up people with moral choice can use. And it has to be said that ultimately, if a person uh, wreaks too much havoc on society and cannot be con constrained in like a closed uh, a closed facility, then human beings kill this person. That is true. 
and this is not something that we that we desire but um it is true that um yeah we we do treat people differently who do not have this uh this faculty of moral choice and the reason why we do not kill for example people just like not children because as christopher said children will develop these qualities over time but people who have a certain form of of mental disability who will never develop them it's basically for the same reason that we do not want to hurt animals unnecessarily it's but the fact remains that human beings with the moral capacity are the moral agents and the other people and animals who do not have these capacities are in that sense objects of the moral choices of people who have the capacity to make moral choices okay okay sure um that makes a little bit more sense to me thank you um i i'd like to jump on one of the sentences that you said in the debate with uh, christopher and that you also repeated now and and that is and i'm going to quote you to be sure that i don't say something wrong here you said very early on in the debate i do agree that there shouldn't be unnecessary suffering in the world and i include animals in that and now you also said that we shouldn't cause unnecessary uh, suffering or some some variant of that and like i i spent a lot of times talking to farmers in and people working with animals and slaughterhouse workers and so forth and all of them will agree with one uh, specific thing and that is that slaughter, slaughter will, all, will always cause some pain some suffering some insecurities some fear in the animals that we slaughter so by definition slaughter does cause pain suffering fear and 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 those those things so so then we come back to the word unnecessary because since we know that it is unnecessary to eat animals it's not some vegan idea it is backed by almost everything we have of science right now that we can live good lives without eating animals then by definition eating animal does cause unnecessary suffering harm and pain and fear so so if you truly believe that we should cause we should not cause unnecessary suffering pain and so forth then it follows naturally that no matter the moral value of animals or no matter the rights that we grant them then we should simply take away our own rights to kill them unnecessarily for something that we can get from other sources so um first of all i would i wouldn't use the word unnecessary so if i used that perhaps i was being a little bit imprecise i would rather say whether it's justifiable or not justifiable and i would say that if you kill an animal for food and there is a little bit amount of pain that is just unavoidable it's no way to get around that when killing that animal it is justifiable because you have a good which is nourishment for the body but i would agree that you should minimize that pain uh, but to kill them for uh, nourishing the, the body that is a justifiable cause why because it is a good for our body it's nourishment but that nourishment is available from other sources so we are now causing uh, pain and suffering and 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 fear in in other living individuals that that is just unnecessary so you're just saying it is because we gain from it again it's it's like a circular logic like i get something back from it so there's no moral value to doing it so it's uh, again yeah i would supposing to be brief i would say two criteria for it to be justifiable number one it is good for the body and again as i said earlier it's good even if there are alternatives just as it's good to eat apples even if you can live your whole life without ever eating apples and second if there is no right being violated if animals did have a moral right to life then my argument would completely fail but i have argued that animals do not have a moral right to life that's why nourishment even if alternatives exist is justifiable i, I would like to make a, a comment like i think that uh, if we had seen all animals as moral agents this discussion would have been quite differently 
Uh, I, I think the people here have a bit different views on what are the subjects, what are the objects of morality. Uh, however, if, if you suppose that only humans are the subjects and animals are the objects, and, and you can suppose that nourishment is good, but on the other hand, you inflict some pain, you do something that is to, to some amount necessary or unnecessary. How do you grade this pain? Like, there certainly is a scale, like, to, to what's acceptable. And I guess it's a gradual change where it becomes unacceptable. But what do you think about the ways things are done today with the industrial scale farming, uh, with the meat consumption we have today? What do you think about that? We, we don't have to say that it should be absolutely uh, completely like we do today or nothing at all, but like on the scale between that, well, what do you all you think about that? Uh, can I butt in the before, before you answer, uh, before Christopher answer that one? Because here we're talking about that in uh, in the Western world, there's basically three ways that they call anesthesia in um, in farming. Um, one of them is electrical fork, where they basically uh, barbecue their brains uh, till they're unconscious, or they have um, carbon dioxide, which is painful when you breathe it. It it it, um, it turns into um, into carbonic acid. It's it's really painful. And then the third one would be bolt gun, which also has its uh, issues where uh, you miss this. Sometimes they wake up with brain damage. Like there is in this industry, there is an inevitable consequence that there is a immense amount of suffering. Even if it's like the free range uh, grass fed, they still all have to go to the same slaughterhouse. You know that that there is harm. And in the uh, discussion you had with Amos earlier, you said that it's objectively true that it's not good for your soul and body to inflict harm. But now when you're buying animal products, you're basically paying for other ones, others uh, doing bad things to their, to their soul and body. Yes, um, there are many points that you brought up. and. Uh good points, I think. So first, to the question of Samuel, um, this is a question on which I am still um, kind of making up my mind, because the first question is, is it uh, really true that it's unnecessary to eat animal products at all? Because I know that there are many uh, current uh, research uh, results that say that it is, but science always changes and especially the, 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 um, the what's this word? When the, the advices that scientists give about how you should eat healthily or not, uh, these things are contradictory. And so also there are different human beings with different uh, digestions or different, uh, I don't know, some can digest something better, others can digest it worse, or they have allergies or, or all kinds of different things. So I wouldn't agree that this is just set in stone, that you can, that it's completely unnecessary to eat animal products. And I'm just but, chipping quickly there. Yeah. <clears throat> it is true that some individuals need to eat animal products because they're, they have had surgery or they have some kind of illness. But in general, for human beings, it is adequate in all, in, in all phases of life to eat a uh, plant-based diet with no animal products at all. And that is undisputable by now. And so that you don't know this, of course, I grant you that, that that's not your fault. But it's simply not true what you're saying now. We know that it's possible to live and thrive on a vegan diet. Okay, I will accept that you have this opinion. Um, I'm not sure whether it's true or not, but uh, Amos, can I can I butt in? Here? I would like to continue actually okay. to make my point, if that would be okay, because what I was trying to say is that I do agree with Samuel that. Um, and this is the point that for me is still difficult and I'm not quite made up my mind. Um, I, I would certainly agree that there is a certain amount of animal products that people can eat, which is actually too much because it goes to the point of not even being healthy for them anymore, but actually being harmful. And there it becomes more a case of, of gluttony or of 
overeating for pleasure instead of actually having a good purpose. And where exactly this line is about how many or if at all I want to eat some animal products to get nourishment from or none or more or less. And also the question that Inge brought up about um, factory killing of animals versus uh, basically having a bunch of chickens and rabbits in my garden. Um, I think these are valid questions and this, this line is kind of gradual and in my mind, since I agree with Christopher that no right is being violated, it is up to each individual by his own conscience to decide on this question. As in all cases where um, a right just gives you a, an acceptable area of action. And within that action, you decide based on your own conscience or reason or different other factors that influence your decision. So I'm just trying to think what I will address first because uh, multiple points, points were made here. Uh, yeah, when it comes to industrial farming, uh, I do admit I don't like industrial farming. Modern industrial farming, I don't like that at all. And I would like to have much more, you could say, natural ways of uh, farming animals or, or uh, what term you would like to use. But whether you are for and against industrial farming or what you think of it, that's a separate question from whether it is morally acceptable to kill animals for food. And I maintain that it is morally acceptable because animals do not have a moral right to life. So the question of industrial farming becomes a separate question and one can really dislike industrial farming. And I, I don't like industrial farming and still maintain that no, it's okay to eat meat, for instance. So those are two separate questions. As for whether it is uh, whether there are there is sufficient scientific evidence that human beings in general can live without eating animal food, I am skeptical toward that. But I haven't looked into much of the evidence myself, so I'm not going to have a uh, I'm not going to uh, defend an opinion there. But I will just say uh, I'm skeptical toward what Samuel. Is saying there but again that that will be a separate discussion and again if we for the sake of the argument grant that premise that okay it's possible to live without animal food still animal food is itself good for us just that it's good for us to eat apples even if we can live without eating apples yeah if i could butt in here um uh so there's there's one thing it's, it's not a very huge thing it's just that um the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the biggest the Di dietetics association in the world, has uh, written a peer-reviewed paper that says that uh, all vegetarian diets, including vegan diets, are um, um, nutritionally adequate for um, all people of all ages and even for athletes. So, uh, yeah, there's just too much. And, and there are so many people who live their entire lives with vegans and they don't see any major health uh, issues throughout their lives and such. So, yeah, that there's not, not really anything to um, th uh, this uh, or um, to. Uh, oh, how should I put this? Um, that, that is not really um, anything to discuss, really. But I can understand if you haven't looked into the science, of course. Um, but but in the sense that you say that it's it's good because it has uh, nutrients. So there are drugs out there that got nutrients. Would you say it's okay to eat drugs because they also can give you nourishment? No, because the drugs can harm human beings. But yeah, there well, is no intrinsic harm in eating meat. Uh, well, the major cause of uh, of heart disease is uh, due to uh, consumption of animal products. So I mean, I would say if it, you eat too much of it or you don't eat enough vegetables and fruits and other things you have to have a healthy diet overall and not simply have excess but it's still good in itself to eat meat. I, I would agree with Christopher here that eating animal products isn't necessarily bad for the human body if done in moderation um, and I think right. that that is a, a sidetrack of the debate that I'm not interested in, in, in dwelling into. I think that we can uh, maybe we can agree that there are certain levels of evidence to state that we can live fully and in good lives without even eating animals and but that is a sidetrack um i think that what i struggle with this in, in this conversation is that that you um keep repeating that animals do not have the right to live so that we have the right to take life from them 
um, by autumn, by some kind of automation, as long as it doesn't harm an, uh, humans. And it, it just, I think that you, one of my issues with your video in the in the first uh, in the first uh, round, and also now, is that you make this claim, but you you it, it is it is as far as I can understand, and I'm repeating this now, but it's 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 based on a presupposition that humans are the only species on this planet that has any sort of rights because we have decided what rights is. So we have and we have the might to treat animals as we decide. So it's it's basically a might makes rights. Principle. It's the same as, as so many, many um, uh, other uh, groups of people has used to oppress uh, the ones that they, they have decided that are less than. So, so you can look at history and see what, how, did, how did this and that war, how was that justified? Well, it was justified by one side saying that the other side did not have the right to live or they did not have the right to that land, but it was one side, one powerful side that decided that the other side did not have something. So they decided to just take it. And that's what we're doing to the animals right now. And and, and, that, and that kind of circle of logic that just, I mean, you can you can keep repeating it, that, that animals do not have the right to live because we are the only one with moral agency. But there has been no agreement in this panel that that is true. You, you just, presuppose that that is okay that we accept that but but I do not and and just because you keep repeating it and, and stating it doesn't really change that much for me and it's just simply for me it's just it's just you applying might makes right to justify your wants for uh, energy consumption or nutrient consumption and, and ignoring the fact that you're causing suffering and pain and death to billions or not you but 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 that principle is causing the suffering and death and fear in billions of individuals just because we define us as the powerful i would like to to try once more to address this question of yours and to express better why i maintain this position and the, the core point is no yes i have to make just one brief comment um you said that we cause pain and or this principle causes pain and suffering to billions of individuals but i feel that this is a slightly um i i wouldn't use this word in this instance because it kind of brings together or it but that's your position it makes no distinction between human beings and animals, where I feel a distinction has to be made. How, how doesn't it? Because I mean, if I speak... Animals can feel fear, pain and suffering, and humans can do so, can too. So I don't see the necessity of a distinction in this certain point. Yes, no, I'm talking about when you say this principle causes pain to billions of individuals, um, this sounds or Typically, when we speak of individuals, we mean human being, no. human beings. Well, you don't, but I do, and many so, other. And let me just. So, yeah. if you if you have a dog, you don't see that dog as an individual. Of course, it's an individual in that it's uh, one. Uh, it's a unique example of his species. In that sense, it's an individual, but most people. I feel use the word word individual to mean a human being. But let's keep the definition of the word individual then. It does not mean human being. Can you find a better word to describe? Uh... Yes, billions of animals. It causes suffering to billions of animals. Well, we are also animals, so that wouldn't apply then. No, it. yeah, but the point is that the way we use language, because this is something and I, I wanted to address your question, but now we're getting into something else, but it's also important. So I feel a little bit uh, frustrating sometimes that many animal rights activists and vegans, in, in my term of, of using words, they kind of use words which human beings typically use for interactions with other human beings and which are loaded with a high emotional content like slavery and oppression and, and all these kind of words. And then they use them when they speak about animals. And I feel that this is a problem because 
you are using more just the emotional content of the word that you are using instead of making actually a rational argument for your point. But almost to to be fair, uh, like throughout history, when uh, when rights weren't granted to let's say um, black slaves of of uh, America, I'm sure they also used loaded words, and I'm sure that many people would say this exact same thing as you. Oh, you use loaded uh, loaded expressions, but I don't see why that is a problem. Well, first of all. Just because it was done in the past doesn't mean that it's a good practice for our current conversation where we are trying to figure out the rational principles, whether it's okay to eat animals or not. No, um, but I'm talking secondly, about words if, used. If I am using loaded words, then uh, please uh, tell me. No, 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 no. I'm saying that you have a problem with vegans using loaded words. Well, I'm sure that throughout history, People have has, has always had a problem if they themselves are like part of the oppressors that people use loaded words. Oh, why do you call me? A, why, why do you use slave owner in the negative, for example? Like, no, this is something we actually don't like. So, of course, we use loaded words. I, I can also just add very quickly, I don't think that the word individual is very loaded. I think that I think we could have that debate about the word uh, animal slaves or whatever. But but now I simply said that animals are individuals and they are hurt and they're they're experiencing pain and suffering. And suddenly you turn the debate around because it's too hard for you to envision animals as individuals. And I think that is uh, I think that's unfair of you, because I, I would have said I would have accepted that earlier on. But now I simply said that. We do cause suffering and pain to millions and billions of individuals. And I do not agree that the word individual is very loaded just because many humans don't see animals as individuals. So if I could uh, respond to uh, what you said, uh, Samuel Rooster, I sort of feel that you are, have been ignoring exactly what I have been arguing for. I'm neither almost nor myself have been stating that we have a right to moral life, other animals do not, because might makes right. I've not been arguing that at all. My argument is that when we reflect about the nature of morality and the nature of moral goods, we understand and comprehend that morality is about making choices. It's about free choices. It's not simply about sentience or the ability to feel pain. It's about making good choices that is what morality is all about that is what the very nature or essence of morality is about so neither Amos nor i have been stating that oh it's because we are powerful and mighty no we're making a very uh, metaphysical or at least i'm making a very metaphysical philosophical argument for why morality and moral rights can only be grounded in being a moral agent with the inherent potential of creating moral goods and i, I sort of feel that you have not entirely address that argument because you're stating that oh i'm sort of making the might makes right principle but i've not been arguing that w one bit no 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 you're not using those words but you are saying uh, because human ergo uh rights and 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 because we have the capacity uh, to gain from oppressing other individual species then we can do so so it is it is a might makes rights principle it's the application of that principle but just used in other words no no because i'm not grounding morality in strength or might i'm granting in in the ability to make choices free will and and the abstract comprehension of choosing between right and wrong and human beings happen to have that feature so it is this intellectual feature or intellectual power which i am uh, talking about not might so it, one thing is to disagree with my argument, but I feel that you've sort of been ignoring that I'm talking about the nature of morality being about free choices. Do you, do you sort of see my point? I do. I do to a certain degree. Degree, um, but I just think that you're you're overlooking a lot of the points that are neglecting or that are um, being in contrast to that. I think that well. <sighs> One thing could be, for example, that, well, humans have the capacity of making moral choices, which means that we also have the capacity to, be, to do the opposite. Animals do not, ergo, they're uh, morally superior because they do not make morally poor uh, choices, what, which we do. Um, we kill each other, we pollute the planet, we pollute all the systems that, that make, make the living for us possible. 
and we, I mean, in terms of what species on this planet causes the most uh, damage and and um, eradicates the most other species, we are definitely the worst. So granted then that we are this, that species that does the most harm, then by definition, we should have the least moral rights to inflict our choices onto other. Well, it's true that many human beings commit evil acts. That's of course a true fact, but that's irrelevant to the point because the point is yes but we still have the capacity to make moral goods or moral virtues and thus thus we have a basis for morality even though yes many people have done very bad things that doesn't mean that morality is not about making good choices but let me ask you a question then how would let's say because you 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 argued against my my point that that you are defining that only humans ever but how would um, um, a cat make a choice that would more, was moral? How would that fit into your world view? How could that be done? Well, that's sort of the point that it couldn't be done. It's metaphysically impossible. It's inconceivable because it's not in the nature of a cat, just as it's impossible for a tree or a stone to make intellectual choices because it's not in the nature. It's true we see cats and dogs making emotional acts, that's not, not, not the same as moral choices. So, so how can you define the difference, please, so that I understand? Emotional, that simply means that you act based on feeling. But when you make a moral choice, you can comprehend right versus wrong and, and make a rational choice about something you say, okay, I, I'm doing something that is morally good now. That is different from merely acting based on feeling. Feelings can be wrong or right, depending on something else. But I still don't see how this kind of, because if, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I didn't mean to lie, lie but it, it just, again, it goes, it, it is a circle of logic. It is simply saying that since we are humans, we are in the position that no other animals can be because we have defined ourselves into that position. And, oh, and, the, yeah, no. the reason why it is the human beings that are is relevant is because we have the capacity for free choice. I'm not starting out with the axiom, we are human beings, thus everything has forms. I am arguing for the basis of the nature of morality and then say, oh, human beings happen to have the free will. Hence, it's relevant and applicable to us, but not human beings. No, sorry, and not, um, not animals. But, you but, see my point? Yeah, but many would argue that humans doesn't really have free will as well. We are, as other animal species are, we are um, constricted to the society around us, to the, to the um, animals around us, and like... Uh, a wolf has the free will to attack another wolf, but then it will be ostracized from its pack um, or not. But, but at, at the same time, I have the free will to kill, but then I would be put into prison if somebody uh, sees what I do. So there are, I mean, to, to just again presuppose that animals do not have free will, which was what you did right now, uh, and maybe you didn't mean to do so. But, but again, you're just saying that because you can't see something, then it is not there. If, well, if the burn of yeah, sorry, go ahead. Mm. Well, the, the free will debate, whether human beings have free will and whether animals do not have free will, I think this would be very interesting and perhaps we can have a round two. It's now, we don't have time to get into this, I feel, but it's a valid uh, problem. And I would like to try once more to address your question. So, the point is not human beings are the only ones who have rights because that's just what I prefer or that's just because we are stronger, but it's because we are the only ones who use concepts and make moral choices. And to, to talk about rights is um, a right is a human concept. And the, the point, a right always also comes with a certain duty on the other side because rights is what human beings use to organize their interaction in social groups for example let's say i have the right uh, to move freely but if i start hitting other people on the head then human people human beings will very quickly start to interfere with my right of moving freely so this right is not just granted arbitrarily or 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 forever, but it's linked to certain conditions, namely that I also respect the rights of all the others. And so even if we started with the assumption 
that human that animals, for example, also have the right to life. Yeah, well, then as soon as, for example, a lion attacks my kid, then then it made itself uh, it 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 uh, violated this contract. And then what should we do? Should we put it in front of a judge and a jury, or uh, should we put it in prison? And so it it doesn't work. This concept of of extending rights onto other species who do not have this capacity for rationality and moral choice. Well, the thing is, when I listen to you, it sounds like a very, uh, very um, complicated way to say that you value a social contract. Is that it? I, I'm, I'm not a particular fan of this social contract concept I, I can't really answer this question just yes or no so no no it, it's just it, it sounds like that it's, it, it's like we have created this system within our social structure it, it, it seems like you, you it sounds just too arbitrary to me to be honest like humans has created rights well of course we have created rights why does it matter I, I thought we created rights because we have preferences Maybe just a brief point. I'm not saying that we have created them arbitrarily. I'm, I'm saying that the, the human beings form societies and they organize their interaction in societies. But there are, of course, false definitions of rights and there are true definitions of rights. And I would maintain that the true definition comes from human nature, as we have once briefly touched in the beginning of this uh, conversation. Okay, so so a quick quick point on that. I mean, I know that Christopher is is getting ready to leave now, so I'm gonna I want to give you the the room to also, also speak. But but regarding moral choices, I mean, a deer could choose to kick an, another deer, um, um, but deer knows what pain is because they have experienced pain. So could you not argue that? when a deer does not kick another deer or hurt another deer, then that's a moral choice also. And if not, why not? Well, as, as far as I see, and there is probably the point where you would say that um, I'm lacking some knowledge of the most modern uh, research uh, results on, on animals, but as far as I know, there is no any evidence that the deer actually has a form of free will or conscious deliberation process and comparing his action to a abstract concept like the right of not being kicked or not being hurt and then making a decision is just based on on instinct and learned behavior and emotion. That's at least as far as I know. Well, couldn't you argue that most of the things that we do are based on learned behavior as well? Because I know that if I if I hit you in the face, that I've learned that that causes pain, and I also know that society will punish me if I do so. So the idea that that all of our actions are just like some intuitive moral, well, we've learned them from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution and, and societal development. We have seen that if we live in a society where we kill each other freely, then we have less people. And in a tribal society, that will mean less warriors and less, less mothers and less people to, to, to raise the children. But now as society has evolved, then we need to update the rules so that it fits to the, the rules that we have. We didn't, we, are, we weren't born with the idea that I shouldn't hurt someone because you can see children hurting other children and learning that it, it causes pain. So, I mean, wouldn't that go both ways? Um, I would tend to agree. Yes, of course, uh, morality is to a large extent learned. And of course, we have a history of evolution and of trying to figure out the right moral rules to live by. And I would also add that we are by no means finished with this process if you look around the world. But um, to me, that's not a, a contradiction of my argument that we have concepts and abstractions and a deer, to my knowledge, doesn't. But that, that again just goes to say that we we have learned behavior, animals have learned behavior. We just choose to call our learned behavior for morals and ethics and, 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 and rights and, and rules. 
But just because we have a language to describe learned behavior in a different way than we, we don't know what animals talk about. We don't know how their communicative skills are, but just because we have a different one with a different set of words that we use, then we could somehow claim the right to kill them. I mean, I mean, I don't see the logic in this at all. Um, yes, if I could uh, comment there. Uh, first of all, I have to go in about 14, 15 minutes from now, just so, so that you know, 14, 15 minutes. Uh, okay, um, when it comes to learned behavior between animals and human beings, I would say that we see that human beings, we can make intellectual abstract based choices. We can understand morality right from wrong. And as Amos has pointed out, we have the capacity to understand abstract concepts, concepts such as rights, duties, uh, and, and morality itself. But when it comes to human, uh, sorry, animals, uh, we see them uh, acting based on instinct or affection. And yes, they can do things as solving tasks and also in a very primitive sense, communicate with each other. But that very primitive sense of communication evolved no intellectual communication of concepts. It's rather just making sounds and then animals act based on hearing specific kinds of sounds. So it's a sensation based communication, not an intellect based communication. For instance, a rabbit communicates by uh, stumping on the ground and then the other animal, uh, rabbits will hear that noise and understand, oh, there is danger. We have to watch out. Well, that's simply a noise that makes them compre uh, not comprehend, but register uh, sense data, if you want to call it that. That's not the same as communicating words which represent abstract concepts such as justice, prudence, love, chastity, etc. Just a quick note to that: there has been a lot of research on specifically on birds because they have so, so uh, such a big range in vocal capability, capabilities, and that, well, our language is definitely definitely more evolved. Our, our vocal cords are more evolved in many ways, but they do have different sounds for different things, meaning that they have a language, although it's more primitive than ours. And, but that doesn't really, I mean, the fact that somebody is more primitive th than us doesn't really make it make a difference here. I mean, they're just, it's just like, again, we are, um, uh, you're arguing that since we are superior them, and I don't follow. No, we are arguing that different concepts apply only to things who have the criteria that make for the application of this principle or of this concept. Um, you cannot say like, and, and yeah, a, a right is a concept that applies to a human being in a society of human beings, or you cannot just apply any concept to any other entity as you please. The question is, is this concept applicable in this case or not? And if it's not, well, then it's not. It's not It's not arbitrary. It's just the fact of nature. Yeah, so, so I have a question there. Say that we have discovered some new island with, uh, I don't know, Neanderthals or something like that on it. How, how should we have gone around thinking about uh, such a different species? Well, if we can communicate with them and form contracts or agreements in the sense of I will not hurt you if you will not hurt me or I will respect what you are doing as long as you leave me alone, then we should treat them as we treat other moral agents. And if we cannot do that, then it's a different question. And if it's something in between, then I don't really know what to do. So. Yeah, well, well uh, one thing that I can say here clearly, because I've grown up with with goats, with sheep, with dogs. Uh, we now have a pig. I've played with uh, cattle. I've uh, ridden horses. Like, you, you're trying to say that these can't make agreements with you. Well, of course they can. Like, I make agreements with my pig many times. Like, we've had an agreement that if he is going out to pee or whatever, I have to toss out, uh, out food for him. Even if he wants to go out, I have to toss out food for him. Like this, this is an agreement we have with each other. How is that not an agreement? That's absolutely not an agreement. It's just, uh, this is uh, what Pavlov called conditioning. It's uh, you, you give an animal food and because it likes food, it will do this behavior that you want it to do so that you give it food. I mean, 
Skinner has made, uh, there's a, a guy, B.F. Skinner, he's an animal researcher, and he made rats run through all kinds of labyrinths and go up and down ladders just by giving them food pellets in the right moment. But that's not an agreement, that's just conditioning. We, we could probably do the same to humans, though, if we, if we chose what and when they could eat, and we said, well, if you, if you ring this bell, you'll get a food. We can probably condition humans as well. That's a side point, though. Um, no, you can, of course. Yeah. But still, the human being has the capacity to make a choice to resist this conditioning, whereas in animals, I have never so far heard of this. Well, I, I have, actually. So that's an interesting point I would like to touch upon really quickly. Um, um, Perola named, mentioned earlier that one of the ways that we treat pigs in slaughterhouses is that we lower them into a gas chamber and we gas them with a with a gas that turns into a carbonic acid which causes a lot of pain and suffering to the pigs and we do this to thousands of pigs every single day it's the most common way we we suffocate or we how to say it in english uh, make them unconscious in, uh, suffocate in, yeah yeah but it's, it's the way where that we we kind of make them um in the faint um, Unconscious. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. unconscious before we slaughter them. So, so we know that this causes pain. There's a lot of studies on this, and one of them, one of the experiments that was done in in, in Zurich, was that they 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 the food for the pig was in a box, and the pig would would go into that box, get food, and go and do whatever he wanted else. So he would go in and go out of that box, and then one day when the food was in the box, they uh, filled the whole box with carbon dioxide. So the pig would would suffocate, and then they would pull her out and let her uh, wake up again because it, it is um, it, it, it is it, it doesn't kill the pig unless you leave her there for a long time. And then for three or four days, this pig would rather starve than go back into that box because it, because she knew there would or she feared that there would be pain and suffering inside of this box. So we have seen. Uh, evidence of, of animals learning a certain behavior and then and then denying to do that behavior further because it, it was then associated with pain. Yes, but again, that's nothing like an agreement. That's just learned behavior to strive towards pleasure and to avoid pain. I agree that animals can do that. I don't know to what extent or what the limit of it is, but that's not the same as having an agreement like two human beings can have an agreement. I agree. I agree with that for sure. I'm just saying that animals do, uh, they can say no to food, even if they have a long lived learned uh, social uh, structure where this results in food, then they can have one experience that topples that entire thing because they see yes, that because there's it's, it's more crucial for their survival. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Well, food is, is crucial for their survival and, and they, and that pig did survive the pain, but it shows to starve rather than experience that pain one more time. So, uh, if I could comment there on the question about what if we met some Neanderthal uh, or what could you say the same about hypothetical aliens, intelligent aliens being us. Um, I would say yes, if they can make uh, moral choices, if we say that they do the same moral behavior as human beings do, then yes, we would say, okay, the same argument applies to them as well. They have also the moral uh, right to life. And I would also say that if it could be proved that an animal had the intellectual capacity to make moral choices, then the argument I'm presenting would also apply to them that it would then be wrong to kill that particular animal. But I haven't seen evidence for that. Also, just uh, briefly, uh, it's just a few minutes that I have to go. So I'm not sure if Inge wants to have a, a formal ending of the debate where we have uh, our last statements or something. But yeah, what do you think? Um, I leave that to you guys. Maybe it could be nice to have a sum up of uh, if we have learned something, if we moved. Uh, like, yeah. How about we do something like that? Say a bit about uh, what we think we learned and what we would like to, I don't know, explore more in the future. Right. Uh... But I, I saw Per Ola, you had some point you wanted to raise. Uh, do you still want to raise that point? Because it's fine for me if you want to address that before we... I, I don't remember it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, I can start uh, with my uh, statement. Well, I think this discussion has been very interesting and uh, productive. We made many interesting points. Um, obviously, we still disagree about uh, veganism and the legitimacy of killing 
animals for food. Um, but I think this was still a, a productive uh, conversation. I uh, enjoyed participating in it. And I will also say I'm very open to have a new conversation at another date if everyone here else uh, wants to do so as well about this topic or some other topic and i'm very open to that as well um so yeah um i don't have anything very particular to say about the content of our debate other than yes we we disagree we have some other philosophical beliefs and hopefully uh you two who are vegans will change your mind in the future but now we we haven't done so we could say but it was still a productive and interesting conversation and i thank you all for participating and uh, and as i said i am very open to have a new one uh, if everyone desires that isn't it interesting i have a question uh, why would you like them to change their mind does it bother you would it bother the rest of humanity anything at all that some of us choose to be vegan I mean, I haven't done that yet, but I don't know. Right, so I uh, I would say that I want people to embrace true positions, the truth. I think truth itself is a value that people should uh, embrace. And I also think that not to acknowledge the uniqueness of human beings with regards to morality and moral rights, perhaps you can argue that it doesn't fully recognize the dignity that is due to human beings. It lowers the dignity to human beings. So uh, you could also make that argument, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I think this is also one of the core issues or one of the core points between the two different positions there. So yeah, that makes sense. Should I continue or? Okay, so um, yeah, I also found the discussion uh, stimulating and worthwhile and I would also be uh, here for having a part two. I would really enjoy that. Um, I will just summarize briefly the core points that I took from this discussion. And of course, this is subjective, but um, I think still in my mind, it's true that morality is about or the, the, the criterion that makes something a moral agent is having the capacity to make free choices and also rationality and comparing one's own behavior to abstract concepts. And in that sense, I would, and to some degree, I think you have agreed with this, I would still maintain that animals are not moral agents. They are objects of moral rules that human beings uh, make up or decide upon in their interaction or figure out based on human nature. That would be the better alternative. Um, we had a long conversation about the right to life where we have a little bit perhaps talked past each other. Um, we have both uh, repeated our position often, but um, didn't really get further. So perhaps it would be worthwhile to really try to understand also from my side, your position, and then we could get further there maybe. Um, also, uh, there was the question of free will. Do human beings have free will and do animals have free will or not? Uh, as a thing to be discussed perhaps another time. And also this question of words or the use of emotionally loaded language, which came up once uh, quite briefly and we then never really got back to that topic, I think would also be worthwhile to go deeper into this in a second conversation. So these are, I think, my my main takeaways and thank you all for for participating in this and yeah see you sometime yeah thank you it's it's a good summary uh i think for another discussion it would be interesting to try to see if we could all make more propositions say given that this is true how would would, would the rest follow because i think there are some of the principal parts that you guys are never going to agree on really but I think you would agree that you would say, given this position, how do we then end up? Anyway, please continue. I don't know, Paola, would you like to continue? Yeah, I can do. Uh, first of all, uh, this has been way more productive than any other debates I've had in the past, uh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, great. Um, but one thing that I just, 
I'm still baffled by like how language is being used here. Um, me personally, I um, I just think that morals are subjective. It's just I just have a preference that also other don't uh, harm animals. Uh, so we we touched a lot upon like the part about like um, uh, being a moral agent, and I like I don't see being a moral agent as a morally substantive difference necessarily. So I could just as well say that, well, I have a, um, well, I, I value, I value pigs. I don't think we should kill pigs, but I think we should uh, eat dogs because um, pigs have a much more preference of uh, eating different foods than dogs have. So therefore I kill dogs, but keep pigs alive. That, that, that's, that's just the way, the way that I see this because I don't see why it's morally relevant for someone to be a moral agent in order to grant them the right to life, for example. Um, so that was that point. And another thing is that I, I keep not understanding like how you make these like um, objective claims. Like I, I don't like who says that this is right. Like who who does this and that. But on the other hand, I I feel like I understand uh, or understood a little bit more about like where are you coming from but not quite. So I, I'm still a very huge question mark, but um, it was productive nevertheless. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that as well. I, I, I think it's been a good conversation, although I, I don't know how productive it was, but I was happy that it wasn't too much bickering and shouting on top of each other and so forth. It's been quite civil. Uh, and it's obvious that there are some different stands here and uh, maybe they're just a priori. Maybe <laughs> maybe you don't get any further there. Let's see. Samuel. Well, I, first of all, I think it's been very interesting. Um, if, if productive can be defined as making changes, then I don't think we have changed too much in our perspectives. Um, I think that we are quite firm uh, from the vegan side on our perspectives, and I think that you are too. Um, what I have uh, appreciated is the fact that we've been very civil. You have been more civil than I have. I've been a little bit emotional at a certain point, and I apologize for that. Um, I definitely think that we can gain much from having further conversations, though I think it is, it is also very easy to say that to just because I, I keep coming back to the fact that I think that we, if we simply presuppose that humans are humans and that thus we have rights, then it's, it's just too simple to, to inflict pain and suffering on others when it's not necessary. And for me, I don't really care about moral agency when it comes to whether or not we should be assholes to other living beings. Um, for me, it's as simple as I don't have to kill you and, and, and thus I don't want to. And, and I'm not saying that everybody who eats meat is asshole, but I think it's an asshole thing to do. Um, if that's, <laughs> if that's clear enough, even because, because it's simply, it, if we define, if we see animals as living individuals who has any kind of preference and we choose to ignore that preference just because it has some value to us, then I just think it's too simple to say that we are humans, they are not, and thus we can do it. And I know that you are arguing that you haven't said that. I just haven't been convinced but maybe we can do that in the future. So thank you for the conversation and for having interesting points and for, for being patient uh, to try to explain things that I did not understand because you did try many times and I do appreciate that. All right, everyone happy? Oh, I hope you get well, become vegan in the future. Like yeah. Just to have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm. Um, I, I I'm not sure if I'm happy, but I'm more satisfied than I thought I would be. That yeah. for sure. That's the best we can hope for, I think. Right. So then, I wish you all a good time, and perhaps there will be a part two, and we can discuss that off offline. And yeah, we will see. So yeah. goodbye, everyone. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so I say, yeah, uh, Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen, yes. Auf Wiedersehen. Wiedersehen. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.